sorry. Good afternoon from Geneva, Switzerland, and welcome to the first of two panel discussions to commemorate the 25th um, anniversary of the World Trade Organization. My name is Vonai Miambo. I'm an external relations officer here at the WTO, and I'll be moderating this panel discussion. Earlier, we had the opportunity to hear from Federal Counselor and Vice President Guy Pamelin of the Swiss Confederation. We also heard from the Chairman of the General Council, Ambassador David Walker of New Zealand, and Deputy Director General Alan Wolfe. We now have the opportunity to have a political perspective from a panel of government officials, including ministers, on the role um, that the WTO has played in the economies, more specifically how the WTO has evolved over the past 25 years. They're going to be sharing with us their views on how the WTO has um, affected the economies, the impact it has had. It'll, we will also look at the uh, shortcomings that the system may have had, and they will share their views on how they feel that uh, we can facilitate the integration of least developed countries as well as developing countries into the multilateral trading system. Let me introduce our panelists. First, we have a Vice Minister and Deputy International Trade Representative Wang Shouwen from the Ministry of Commerce of China. Welcome, Vice Minister. We oh. have Director General Sabine Wyant, DG Trade of the European Union. Welcome, DG. We have Her Excellency Ambassador Cheryl Spencer, Ambassador of Jamaica and Coordinator of the ACP Group. Welcome, Ambassador. We have Mr. George Yeo, former Trade and Foreign Minister of Singapore. Welcome, Mr. Yeo. We have His Excellency Ambassador Dave Dennis Shea, Deputy United States Trade Representative and Ambassador to the WTO. Welcome, Ambassador. We will be joined a little bit later by Soraya Hakuziaremye, Minister of Trade and Industry from Rwanda, who is also currently attending the AU Ministers' Meeting. It is a privilege to have you all here with us, and I'd like to thank you all for, for making the time and taking the time out of your busy schedules. I'd also like to welcome all our viewers that are joining us from all around the world. Before we begin, I would just like to um, explain to you how this panel discussion will proceed. We will start with opening statements from our panelists, then we will continue on with a 30-minute discussion amongst the panelists, and then we will open to you, the viewers, uh, to provide your questions to the panelists. Your questions can be submitted via our social media and our Slido page. Instructions on how to use Slido are on your screen right now, as well as under the webcast player window. You enter Slido in your browser, and you use the event code AskWTO at 25. On social media, you can use our Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn pages, and you can send your question using hashtag AskWTO at 25. I will do my best to um, ask as many questions as I can, depending on how much time we have. I would like to ask our viewers, when you're submitting your questions, if you could please um, specify who you are, where you're coming from, and if you are directing your question to somebody specific from our panel. I would also like to humbly ask our panelists if you can keep uh, your statements to no more than five minutes to enable us to have enough time for uh, discussion and questions. With that, um, let us begin. I would like to start off by inviting a Vice Minister Wong to make his statement. You have the floor, Ms. Vice Minister. It's my pleasure and honor to join today's panel discussion. Thank you for the invitation. 25 years ago, WTO, the very first international organization regulating global trade with the rule of law was created for boosting trade and economy, raising living standards for all people, pursuing sustainable development, and helping developing members and the LDCs. Ever since, the WTO has made a unique and historic contribution to the world welcoming 88 new members, expanding the world trade by three times, cutting the tariff by half, reaching the new agreements on trade facilitation, ITA expansion, prohibition of export subsidy for agriculture, resolving over 500 trade disputes, and above all, helping lift 
hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Even in the shadow of COVID-19 pandemic, most WTO members hold on to the fundamental principles of the WTO. Of all the new measures adopted during the crisis, two thirds of those measures are designed to facilitate trade instead of restricting trade. Despite the limitations and challenges facing the WTO, the collective decision to create this organization was definitely proven to be on the right side of history. 19 years ago, China joined the WTO. That was a great milestone in China's reform and opening up endeavor. China has fulfilled its pledge, reducing its average tariff on goods from 15.3% to 7.6%, opening up more than 100 subsectors in services and even over delivering its commitments on IPR protection. Meanwhile, China's imports of goods and services have expanded seven times. China has implemented all the dispute settlement mechanism rulings and recommendations it was involved in, even though some of those rulings unfavorable to China. China has also improved its performance on transparency with a track record of notification on subsidies, keeping up with most developed members. China is a major trading partner for more than 120 countries and regions around the world. And China has been the largest export destination for the LDCs in the past decade. Despite all its achievements, some people are worried that the WTO could collapse. The applied body would remain paralyzed and the direct general selection would get stalled. Some are disappointed in that the long-standing issues of the public stock holding for food security purposes and AMS are still unresolved and the spreading unilateralism and protectionism is eroding the foundation the WTO. But some members are still hopeful that the WTO could continue to deliver as new issues, including investment facilitation for development and e-commerce, are making steady progress while getting growing attention. Today, the world needs a well-functioning WTO more than ever. When the WTO is facing unprecedented existential crisis, a rules-based multilateral trading system would help get over the challenges posed by the pandemic. The top priority in China's view is to restore faith and confidence in the WTO. For that matter, it is urgent to appoint a new DG based on agreed rules and announced result. The next task is to get the body back on track as soon as possible, as MPN, the multi-party interim appeal, is by no means designed to replace the appellate body. Negotiations on agriculture, fishery subsidies, investment facilitation, and e-commerce should be accelerated toward a meaningful and balanced outcome. Special and differential treatment is an integral part of the WTO agreements, and it is our common responsibility to make those provisions more precise, effective, and operational. As a developing member, China is more than willing to undertake obligations commensurate with its capacity and level of development. The ninth LDC Roundtable, under the framework of China program, will be held next month in cooperation with the WTO Secretariat, and China will make another contribution of half a million US dollars to that program. The past quarter century of the WTO history has clearly demonstrated a proven vision of multilateralism. Let us come back to work to build a trading community of shared interests, shared benefits, and shared future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Wong, for those opening uh, remarks and your statement. We would li now like to move to Director General Wyand. You have the floor, Director General. <laughs>
thank you very much uh, for the invitation today. And I'm very happy to be here because I think the WTO has every reason to be proud of its achievements over the past 25 years, building on the successes of uh, its predecessor, the GATT. And I'm not going to repeat uh, all that has already been said today about just how the WTO has contributed to the expansion not only of trade, but also of economic prosperity, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And in today's world, I think it is even clearer that the founding principles of non-discrimination, sustainability, predictability, fairness and progressive liberalization are more necessary than ever if we want to get our way out of this crisis that we are currently uh, faced with. Now, we have to also uh, uh, recognize that the WTO at 25 faces its biggest crisis so far. And I would like to look forward to what we can do uh, in order to redress that situation and make sure that when we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the WTO, we can look back at a story of continued success. We have to recognize that the WTO has been in crisis for several years now, with the WTO dispute settlement function being truncated, negotiations not delivering tangible results, and an underused deliberating, deliberation and monitoring function. The WTO lacks a common sense of purpose and it has not adapted to the changes that have shaped uh, the global economy over the last decade, such as the digital transformation, the climate crisis, or the emergence of China as the largest trading nation. The COVID-19 pandemic has added another dimension to this crisis the WTO is facing. It requires a new response from the WTO and the membership of the WTO, first of all, in order uh, for it to reassert its relevance and its effectiveness in ensuring that trade remains open and fair. A stable, predictable global trading environment with the WTO at its center is more essential than ever. And that is why uh, in our ongoing review of EU trade policy, we are putting WTO reform, reform center stage um, um, in order to see how we can reinforce the effectiveness, the legitimacy of the WTO in all three functions, negotiation, adjudication and monitoring and deliberation, deliberation function. This reform has to build on the central uh, uh, tenets of the system that remain as valid today as they were in 1995. It should combine ambition and realism, since not all necessary changes can be achieved in one go. So we need to have a sequenced approach that allows the WTO to reap some successes uh, early on. We will need to combine multilateral outcomes with others that take the form of open and inclusive plurilateral agreements, where not all 164 members can move forward uh, immediately together at the same time. Um, the reform needs to enhance the responsiveness of the trading system to our common sustainable development goals and facilitate the integration of those developing countries that are currently still playing a marginal role in trade and investment flows. I would like to suggest that we look at a certain sequence of actions uh, in this reform process. I think we need to focus immediately on confidence building by showing responsiveness to the global concerns that contribute to the implementation of the sustainable development goals. This includes concluding the fisheries negotiations, uh, responding to the pandemic through an initiative on trade and health that ensures uh, that uh, medicines, medical equipment, vaccines can flow freely and reach populations in need. We need to advance the environmental agenda of the WTO by facilitating trade in goods and services that mitigate climate change. And we need to ensure transparency of measures taken to promote the climate transition. Secondly, we need to agree on reforms of the WTO uh, uh, dispute settlement that preserve its binding nature and an independent but accountable appellate body. Provided these two principles are respected, we are ready to reflect jointly on how to improve the system building on the principles developed through the Walker process. We also need to make decisive progress on the development of rules on issues that are critical for the 21st century, such as digital trade and investment facilitation. And we need to start a discussion, a serious discussion, on how WTO disciplines need to be strengthened to deal with the negative spillovers of state intervention in the economy.
we need to make sure uh, uh, that we create a level playing field between different economic systems. It is, given this heavy agenda, uh, more crucial than ever to pro uh, proceed rapidly to appoint the WTO Director General and to focus the organization's attention on preparing a successful MC12 that delivers on an ambitious uh, agenda and sets us firmly on the path to reform. We are looking forward to working with all members to make that happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Director General Weyen, for sharing us uh, with us some of your views on um, how you see how the EU sees uh, moving forward um, on some of these uh, issues and challenges. We'll now um, give the floor to Ambassador Spencer. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Moderator. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I do hope you and yours are keeping safe and healthy at this very difficult time. I'm really honored to have been invited to take part in this very important discussion as a part of the reflection on the momentous journey of the WTO. I feel obligated to start with the fundamental acknowledgement that a strong, effective, inclusive and relevant WTO is in the interest of all its members, developed and developing. Our countries have benefited from the role that the organization has played in international economic governance. Admittedly, the euro by around uh, implementation of the agreements was assessed by many developing countries as a difficult and costly reform. Nevertheless, the WTO was certainly embraced as a tool for improvement in terms of trade, livelihoods, in accordance with the preamble of Marrakech. As a result, we have seen developing countries increasing their share of world trade from 22.5% in 1995 to 44.3% today, and for services trade from 18% in 1990 to 30%. Trade, as we all know, positively contributes to GDP growth, and we have seen a significant increase in GDP since the establishment of the WTO. The WTO has controlled members' use of trade restrictive measures, and importantly, it has contributed to the development objectives of governments in developing countries and LDCs. The organization has also had success in the handling of trade disputes. Importantly, it has assisted countries such as those of the ACP regions with building capacity and provided the incentive to reform trade policies, establish and establish new ones. When we look at the present, the question is whether these positive results have continued and translated into the legitimate expectations of developing countries and LDCs. Unfortunately, the experience and analysis is revealing a lag in benefits and expectations as it relates to WTO's contribution to development and the integration of developing countries and LDCs into global trade and global value chains. Let us take, for example, Africa, which accounts for only 2% of global trade in services and 2.5% of global merchandise trade. Despite having over 16% of the world's population, 6% of the world's landmass, as well as an abundance of resources. In the Caribbean and in the Pacific taken together, we are far below 1% of global trade. The LDC share of global merchandise exports remains under 1%. So too are their share of global services trade. These signal a need for a broader and more inclusive dialogue on how the WTO can better assimilate all of its members, especially developing countries and LDCs. We acknowledge the positive impact of assistance and capacity building, but we need to reflect on whether the Aid for Trade initiative has accomplished what it set out to do. One of the major challenges of the, of the present is a trend in which the solidarity among developing countries has waned since 1995. We are less organized, less resourced due to inevitable fiscal consolidation policies in capitals and therefore less prepared to advance our agenda. Our solidarity in the past has had a greater impact on the work of the WTO than today, which includes the launch of the Doha Round, seen at the time as a WTO reform agenda to remedy important gaps and omissions in the Uruguay Round Agreement. The Doha Round was launched to remedy the trend and to make development the core of the WTO's focus, in alignment with the focus of the Millennium Development Goals, thus it being called the Development Round. Unfortunately, 
We have not been able to conclude the Doha round and increasingly the importance of development is being minimized. With less than desired focus on increasing the share of developing countries in world trade. In the present, we must acknowledge the history and context behind the launch of the Doha round. The very fishery subsidies negotiations, which is now the poster child of the WTO negotiations, is a legacy of the Doha round and the ACP group has played a key part in its re-emergence following years of relative inactivity. This brings me to the issue of agenda setting in the WTO, which has become overwhelmed with issues that are not the primary interest of the vast majority of developing countries. The small size of developing countries' delegations in Geneva has also negatively impacted their ability to effectively advance their own agenda. The challenges posed by a proliferation of plurilateral initiatives is not only putting pressure on multilateralism, but also being shaped in a way and at a pace that gives developing countries limited space to shape the agenda. All of these issues, we believe, should help to frame our discourse on the future of the WTO. Of course, WTO reform is a part of that discourse, but a WTO reform agenda that does not enjoy an open dialogue aimed at developing its structure, scope, parameters, and objectives will inevitably lead to a desire for sustainability of the WTO's long-term operation. We should listen to each other, show flexibility and empathy for our respective unique circumstances, and be conscious of the collective objective of the WTO at all times. For the WTO to remain relevant, inclusive, and sustainable, it has to resolve the impasse over the function of the, of the appellate body. It also has to improve its focus on the pace of negotiating agreements and ensure an inclusivity among its members. It should incorporate issues such as the environment and climate change, food security, women and youth empowerment, the impact of the future of work on developing countries' workforce, better control over the implementation of non-tariff measures, how to resolve obstacles to developing countries and LDCs' participation in new forms of trade, and how to advance a trade diversification agenda in light of the vulnerability of developing countries and LDC exposed by the impact of COVID-19. More also needs to be done to elevate the relevance of the WTO. The average man on the street is not aware of the benefits of the WTO, which sends a message that the WTO needs to engage more in public diplomacy with civil society and at the grassroots level. Finally, it will be important for the finalization of the appointment of the Director General. In closing, COVID has demonstrated that the WTO has a role to play in global economic management and that the extent of global economic interdependence overrides the pursuit of narrow national interests in a multilateral trading system. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Spencer. And uh, we regret that you won't be able to stay um, with us for the discussions. You've raised some very pertinent points, especially where it comes to some of the challenges that the smaller countries um, and the least developed countries are, are, are facing. Um, next, and I'm happy to see that um, the Minister Aku Ziaremye has been able to join us now. Very welcome, um, Minister. You have the floor to make your statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. And, uh, Honorable Wang Shouen, Vice Minister and Deputy International Trade Representative of the Minister of Commerce, uh, People's Republic of China, um, Ambassador Dennis Shi, Ambassador to the WTO of the United States, uh, Ambassador Cheryl Spencer, uh, Madam Sabine Wayan, EU Director General of Trade, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And allow me first to congratulate the WTO Secretariat for organizing the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the WTO with a series of discussions to provide us with an opportunity to reflect and take stock of the achievement as well as challenges facing the organization. Uh, it is really my pleasure to be part of this panel and uh, to offer uh, Rwanda's take and Africa's take on WTO's past, present, and future uh, from a political perspective. This 25th anniversary represents an occasion for us to member state to build on our past achievements as well as re-examine the effectiveness of WTO in today's context. 
Over the last 25 years, the WTO has been thriving to achieve its main key objectives. And since then, a number of achievements have been recorded. And to mention just a few uh, which are important to us, the organization brought together several treaties under one roof to create an, an environment of low tariff for, for its member states, as well as maintain uh, the stability of uh, global trade over a long period of time. Uh, such a predictable environment is uh, crucial for especially our exporters and leads to the emergence of uh, international and global value chains. Uh, the WTO contributed to the strength and stability of the global economy uh, with a lot of challenges that we need to recognize, but it has helped overall to boost trade goals and uh, have solved uh, numerous trade disputes and support the integration of developing countries into the trading system. In the Rwandan context, uh, through the enhanced integrated framework, Rwanda has benefited from the support uh, in form of projects that facilitate both uh, trade uh, domestically and also uh, regionally. We have uh, supported uh, through the EIF cross-border trade um, by supporting implementation of our cross-border strategy in different initiatives, uh, including uh, the construction of cross-border markets and especially capacity development skills for women and youth in the cross-border trade. Um, additionally, with Rwanda's strategic uh, vision to develop e-commerce, uh, we are relying really on the support of the WTO and the Enhanced Integrated Framework so that we can also uh, develop uh, that sector. In the African context, um, we look very much uh, to the support of the WTO as we establish uh, the, the African continental free trade area, uh, which will start trading uh, in January next year, uh, so that the continent can uh, bring more prosperity and a brighter future ahead for its citizens through an integrated market. As the WTO states the ground rules for any regional integration and multilateral trading system, looking ahead, there is a need to improve the cooperation among WTO member states to achieve rapid economic recovery from COVID-19 and from our, for our continent, the continental free trade area will serve just that. As I conclude, I would express our desire that the 12th WTO Ministerial Conference uh, to be held in Kazakhstan in June 2021 provides meaningful guidance to the WTO negotiations for the preservation of multilateralism and encourage all WTO members to show political comm commitment towards the completion of the current Doha Development Agenda negotiation. Let me close by saying that we are, as Rwanda, committed to the multilateral trading system and look forward uh, to the next 25 years of the WTO and next 25 years of the continental free trade area in Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, um, for giving us um, your perspective on uh, how you how the WTO um, has benefited your country and LDC specifically, and um, highlighting some of the, the key programs that the WTO has put in place um, for countries such as yours. We will now move to Mr. Yo to make his statement. You have the floor, Mr. Yo. Thank you, uh, Ms. Boyambo. I can't forget the day in Doha November 2001, when China joined the WTO after long, difficult negotiations. He was happy there. Since then, China's GDP by the end of last year grew seven times in PPP terms, nine times in renminbi terms, and 11 times in US dollar terms. The structure and processes of the WTO no longer fit the realities of the world today. The dramatic emergence of China as a leading trading nation is a major contributor to the crisis of the WTO today. 
For example, developing country status has become too broad a category and needs refinement. China is still in many ways a developing country, but in some areas like 5G and robotics, it is already an advanced country. However, if such modifications to developing country status apply to all developing countries, it will be well nigh impossible to bring in countries like India and South Africa. For domestic political reasons, and partly out of fear of China's competitiveness, India opted out of the recent agreement to establish the RCEP, which includes all 10 ASEAN countries, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Under President Trump, the US has taken a negative view of the WTO and impeding its appellate process. Although part of this view is for negotiating purposes, continuing political support in the US for the WTO is contingent on this reform. In all the WTO meetings I attended, Seattle, Doha, Cancun, the positive leadership of the US was indispensable. The situation today is the opposite. President Trump threatened to take the US out of the Universal Postal Union unless the rate structure was changed. It was unfair that parcel rates from Shanghai to New York were cheaper than from Los Angeles to New York. In the end, China agreed to compromise. In the same way, reform of WTO is needed so that the US sees it in its own interest to remain a member and to revive its leadership. Of course, if the US is unreasonable in its demands, then as former Director General Pascal Lamy suggested a number of times, a WTO version 2.0 without the US would have to be envisaged. However, it is more likely and greatly preferable that all parties negotiate a fair outcome. Under current institutional arrangements, it is difficult to begin a process of reform. How will the key countries negotiate? For practical reasons, we need the Secretariat to play a bigger role. We need the new DG to produce a first draft proposal, however imperfect. Perhaps she will need an advisory panel to ensure that a whole range of views are canvassed. Without the Secretariat catalyzing the reform process, it is hard even to begin. The attitude of the Biden administration will be critical. Before anything can be done, we need a consensus on our new DG. Then we must collectively agree to empower her for the specific purpose of WTO reform and to put up a first draft proposal for initial discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeo, for your statement. And um, you've raised some uh, interesting points on how you see uh, reform uh, going forward. So I think we would ha we'll have an interesting discussion on that. Um, so our next, uh, last but not least, I'll invite Ambassador Shea to take the floor. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Vonai, and uh, good afternoon. I also want to join uh, Ambassador Spencer in wishing everybody in Geneva uh, to stay safe, because I know Geneva is perhaps one of the big hot spot, COVID hotspots uh, today in Europe, so please be safe. Uh, I also want to thank the WTO Secretariat, uh, and particularly Keith Rockwell, who I think has become a bit of an institution uh, over the years at the WTO for organizing uh, this birthday party of sorts. Uh, 
Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, albeit virtually. At the same time, I can't help uh, but be mindful of the substantial work that must be undertaken if the WTO is to convene a similar event in another 25 years time. With WTO reform dominating the discussion in Geneva, a theme the United States keeps coming back to is first principles, those enshrined in the Marrakesh Declaration and Marrakesh Agreement. These principles are the organization's past, are the focus of our work today, and will significantly affect the WTO's future prospects. Simply reaffirming the centrality of the rules-based multilateral trading system, as many like to do, is not enough to set the WTO on a course for renewed relevance. Most importantly, WTO members must have a shared understanding of the core values that ballast the system if this organization is to navigate successfully into the future. The United States believes that all WTO members signed up to certain basic principles, such as maintaining open markets, non-discrimination, market access, reciprocity, fairness, and transparency. Unfortunately, not all members appear to share this view today. During the recent G20 discussions and deliberations at the WTO General Council, few members could not reaffirm the first principle of open market-oriented policies, as highlighted in the Marrakesh Declaration. Uh, this is a fundamental point of divergence. Uh, for the United States, the WTO is and should be a place where countries come together uh, to work towards developing and enforcing rules that promote the common goal of free and fair trade on the basis of openness and market principles. When members opened their economies to competition through the WTO, they did so with a shared understanding that market-oriented conditions would take hold in each of their economies, and this would help ensure a level playing field for the competition to take place. The idea, in other words, was that the WTO would be a place supporting the gradual convergence over time of economic systems, not the coexistence of radically different ones. To reinforce this first principle, the United States, along with Brazil and Japan, is championing a statement at the WTO on upholding market-oriented policies and reinforcing that market orientation lies squarely at the foundation of the WTO. I am pleased that this statement appears to be gaining more attention and support. Unfortunately, the founders of the WTO did not foresee the significant challenges non-market economies would pose to the global trading system. So we need to fix this deficiency. To this end, we are working with Japan and the European Union to expand the WTO rulebook to address the trade distortions caused by non-market economies as a result of the elevated role of state enterprises and the deployment of industrial subsidies on a massive scale. For a successful future, the WTO also needs to get back to its core function of negotiating new rules and new market access. The United States and other co-sponsors are promoting a decision to uphold basic transparency obligations in the WTO. In March of this year, the WTO Secretariat reported that only 45% of members had submitted their required subsidies notifications for 2019. It is difficult, if not impossible, to negotiate new rules if less than half of the membership has submitted required notifications in some areas. For example, we cannot negotiate new industrial subsidy rules if we have no information or inaccurate information from the largest subsidizers. The United States has also advanced a decision that would reserve special and differential treatment to in WTO negotiations for the poorest countries least integrated into the global trading system. Relatively wealthy, advanced, or influential economies need to contribute commensurate with their role in the global economy. I'd like to note that four countries, Brazil, Singapore, Korea, and Costa Rica, who describe themselves as developing countries, recently publicly uh, indicated that they would not seek special and differential treatment in, in current and future negotiations. And that was a very positive step by those countries. Under the 
So addressing, addressing these issues could help us get back to fulfilling the original goal of the multilateral system, which was to reduce tariffs, a role that the WTO has largely abandoned. As U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer has urged, it is time for a reset in global tariff commitments. There's no reason why some countries have very high tariffs and others have very low ones. These inequities result from negotiations that took place many decades ago and don't reflect current economic realities. Uh, the United States has also forcefully, forcefully articulated how the WTO's dispute settlement system has veered off course and must be totally rethought. We need to come up with a dispute settlement system that limits itself to interpreting agreed text, not creating jurisprudence that favors litigation over negotiation. Uh, to prosper in the future, the WTO must also address what is important to stakeholders. This time of crisis has demonstrated our critical dependence on digital tools and the need to better facilitate digital trade. We hope this encourages high ambition in the work now underway at the WTO under the Joint Statement Initiative on e-commerce. On a final note, let me just highlight the importance of concluding an ambitious fisheries subsidies agreement, not only to protect our oceans and their fish stocks, but also to show the WTO remains capable of negotiating multilateral a multilateral outcome. The United States has been a leader on the subject at the WTO putting on the table five separate proposals that among other things would help discipline subsidies that support distant water fishing and contribute to overfishing and overcapacity. Embracing these reforms and advancing negotiations would help reinvigorate the WTO and make it more relevant in light of today's challenges. The United States has been and continues to stand ready to engage on all of these difficult issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and um, thank you for reminding us of the principles um, upon which the WTO was, was created, um, the objectives of, of the work here, and um, obviously you've highlighted how also um, it will be difficult to move forward on some of these issues. I know that the Ambassador Spencer, um, you have to leave us. Uh, Pretty in a couple of minutes. So perhaps at this point, I can give you the floor, having heard all the statements, in case you have uh, a few remarks that you want to make before you leave us. Moderator, for this uh, other opportunity to just make a, a couple of points. Um, I did flag in the previous statement statement, the issue of international cooperation and collaboration in the context of COVID-19, um, as it was a short statement, we were not able to address that uh, too much. But I believe that that is one role that the WTO uh, should be able to improve on uh, in terms of the management of, uh, of the issue of COVID, in terms of collaborating with the WHO and WIPO on issues of access to vaccines and other medicines and to technology um, and other uh, equipment concerning uh, COVID. Um, the other issue is bringing back trade to pre-COVID uh, um, era or the pre-COVID period of time. That is something uh, that the WTO will have a very big role to play. And also COVID has pointed out the need for diversification um, in some of our economies. Um, some of us are tourism-related countries, tourism-centered countries, um, in terms of diver helping us to diversify uh, in, the, uh, in following uh, COVID. Just final word on MC12, um, as we are looking forward to that, and again, I was not able to go into MC12, but I believe that it's something that uh, the WTO, we will need to look a very early or very shortly on how we move forward in terms of having a structured way forward, on the issue of WTO reform, for example, on the issues of what we will be harvesting uh, for MC12. And that would include, include the issue of fisheries subsidies negotiations, if that's not completed by then. I think we need to look at the issue of agriculture. Um, if we do not harvest something on agriculture at MC12, then it would be two uh, ministerial conferences that we would not have had a result as we were not able to have any in MC at MC11. Um, 
And agriculture, of course, is a very, very important issue, as, all, as we all have acknowledged within the context uh, of the WTO. We also need to, and from the Caribbean, the SIDS perspective, finally, to ensure that we incorporate uh, the issues of climate change and environment into the WTO work, work program in a very serious and systematic way. Uh, as we all know, uh, now it's the hurricane season and we are dealing with the double impact of a pandemic and um, natural disasters in countries such as those of the SIDS region. So once again, I'll stop there, but thank you so much and for the opportunity for having participated and to my colleagues uh, for the uh, positions and the points which have been made. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for making the time. And um, you have raised some very important points. And in fact, we will be discussing those um, a little bit further as we, as we go into the discussion period now. And um, we wish you all the best and thank you for joining us. So we will now move um, on to the discussion um, period amongst our panelists. Um, I think a lot of you have raised a lot of uh, important um, elements. Uh, it's a good thing to hear that uh, the WTO has in fact had a positive um, impact on economies, um, on, on, on addressing poverty issues in the past, but um, I think the reality that, that we're all facing right now are the challenges of uh, whether the WTO um, is still fit for purpose, whether it's able to adapt to, to, to the way the, the world is, is, is changing. Um, you've raised a lot of different points in your statements, but I'm going to try and maybe just um, highlight and pick out on, on some common um, points that, that I was hearing. And I think the first one would be um, the COVID pandemic, which also um, the ambassador just made reference to. Now, um, we know that COVID uh, has been affecting livelihoods as well as um, economies all around the world. Um, it's not about size. It's, it's not about where you are. It's just, it's been one of those um, pandemics that has really um, shaken up the global economy. We've been hearing estimates coming in from the IMF um, that uh, global economic um, output is expected uh, this year to decline by about 4.4 percent. Our own WTO economists here um, expect that um, global merchandise trade will uh, reduce by, by 9 percent. At the same time, uh, we know that COVID has been considered as part of the, um, I mean, WTO has been considered as part of the solution, especially when it comes to supply resilience um, and the fact that it has enabled um, countries to have access to some vital um, food and medical products. So um, in this um, regard, I'd like to uh, put a question. And in fact, I'd like um, all of us, all of you, if you can, the panelists to weigh on, in on this question, perhaps um, starting with um, uh, DG Wyand. Um, the question would be, what can and should the WTO do to help um, countries um, to adapt to the challenges that this pandemic has brought about so that we can see uh, the global um, economy getting back, uh, getting going again? And uh, I would just like to ask you that uh, if you can keep your, your um, interventions quite um, short and precise so that we can have more time for, for more questions. So you have the floor, DG Wyand. telegraphically, although this is very difficult, obviously. No, but I think the first thing to do, and I think this was a resource that was underutilized at the beginning of the crisis, is that the WTO should be the linchpin of transparency about the measures that are being taken in the context of the crisis. And I was disappointed to see that in the beginning of the crisis, it was think tanks uh, uh, that stepped up to the plate and ensured transparency. Then the WTO caught up, but I think it is uh, essential that the monitoring function of the WTO is used better to know what countries are actually doing. Um, then I think we need to uh, also look at the negotiating function in this respect, and that is why we are working with a number of like-minded countries on an initiative on trade and health in the WTO, where we have to look at avoiding export restrictions, uh, because we are all working together globally to enhance the availability of effective medicines and vaccines. And it would be absurd, uh, given all the money that is being poured into research, but also into uh, a distribution. Uh, we are, for instance, very much uh, working with this COVAX uh, uh, facility. Uh, we are putting a lot of money and working with the uh, uh, Gavi Alliance. 
Uh, it would be absurd if then this was hampered by uh, high tariffs or export restrictions or whatever. So I really think that we need to look at these issues in order to make sure that we can actually address this virus everywhere, because if we don't eradicate it everywhere, we will not eradicate it anywhere. I think that is uh, uh, the key of what we need to do. Um, and this is something we will bring to the WTO membership uh, uh, very quickly, uh, because for me, this is key for the relevance of the WTO in the current crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. And I think that's, I mean, sorry, DG, and I think that's very much in line with what Ambassador Spencer was talking about, this need for international cooperation uh, with other organizations to ensure that we, we can work together on this. Um, with that, I'd like to um, pose the same question to um, Vice Minister Wong. You have the floor, Vice Minister. Okay, a question, I think, uh, to... Uh, it is very important to get the pandemic under control uh, in the first place in order to mitigate and uh, contain the pandemic or and its impact uh, the wto should facilitate trade flow of uh, ppes testing instruments new therapeutics and vaccines and uh, the new therapeutics and vaccines to be developed be able to play a very important role in controlling the pandemic, thus laying a good foundation for the economic recovery. And in this respect, tariffs or certifications, IPR, should be uh, addressed by the WTO. This pandemic also highlights the importance of the digital tools like e-commerce. So I believe if we can make some progress in e-commerce discussions, that would be also very helpful to get the pandemic under control. I also agree with uh, DG Wiant has said that WTO should do a better job in monitoring the pandemic related measures to make sure that every member keeps their market open and the pandemic related measures should be transparent, proportionate and targeted. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister. And I think uh, there also um, you're, you're raising this issue of transparency, um, which, um, as uh, DG uh, Wyan said as well before, the WTO is in fact now um, got a dedicated website that um, really looks at um, seeing any measures that have been put in place um, so that we know exactly what's going on. And again, when you talk about the different specific areas in which uh, we should be working on, particularly trade facilitation, um, we know that we have a trade facilitation agreement which uh, could help in this regard, but also there are other areas which perhaps go to the negotiating function and, and members working together to do more um, to try and find solutions. Um, next, I think I'll um, call on Minister Hakuzi Aremia. You have the floor, Minister. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think um, uh, going forward, when we look at uh, the impact that COVID-19 has had uh, on the economies, especially uh, for, for LDCs and developing countries, um, although um, we have managed, uh, and here if I'm talking about Rwanda specifically, to really contain uh, the pandemic, but at the beginning of the pandemic, our first case was in March uh, this year, uh, the, the export restrictions, especially access to, uh, to, to, to PPEs and, and why we were still uh, trying to get our own, um, uh, let's say, uh, industries to, to, to manufacture masks, uh, was something that was worrisome and, and we really think that as we go forward, that's where WTO comes in to really make sure that, uh, you know, uh, to build on international cooperation, but also ensuring that uh, least developed countries can have access not only to the PPEs, but the vaccine going forward, but also uh, making sure that it works closely uh, with the uh, regional economic communities, especially in Africa, to, to also assist in harmonization of, 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 of measures. Um, you know, we've had 
uh, pandemics uh, before in Africa, if I talk about Ebola in West Africa, for instance, and we're not sure we won't have any uh, global or continental pandemic. So it's to really, uh, you know, urge WTO to continue working with the, uh, in our case, the East African community or the common market of Eastern and Southern Africa, so that we can have strong mechanisms uh, for countries, uh, especially regional countries, to, to cooperate um, in, 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 in ensuring, uh, you know, uh, facilitation of, of, of the movement of goods, uh, which was uh, something that, uh, especially for a country like Rwanda, that's landlocked and depends on, on supply chains uh, from, from uh, our neighboring countries, that, that uh, you know, during a pandemic such as this, that cooperation uh, and the mechanism are there and WTO is there to, to assist uh, on that journey. Uh, another thing I want you to also uh, maybe stress on is, is how uh, moving um, forward or going forward uh, post-pandemic, how do we make sure as well that the WTO is at the heart of, of um, new initiatives? Uh, we were recently uh, at a WTO unit uh, event on trade and environment, and the, the um, impact of climate change uh, for, for African countries is there uh, being on our cultural sector, uh, which, which we think is also some, um, an area where WTO um, you know, would, would come in. And I think we, we could see that its role uh, towards the, the least developed countries in, 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 in the fight against climate change, uh, and also ensuring that in our industrialization journey, and also as we uh, uh, are integrated uh, in global value chains, uh, that also is, is uh, taken into account in the different programs that uh, the WTO uh, support us with. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And you, you made reference to this issue of export restrictions. And uh, as you rightly said, you know, with uh, countries being so interconnected and so dependent on one another, um, especially with small countries, this can be uh, a real um, problem to access. And I know that, and, and maybe this is why I would like to maybe put this, the, uh, give the floor to, to Mr. Yo, because I know that Singapore has um, been putting forward some proposals um, in the area, I think it's of agriculture regarding sort of export restrictions. And um, perhaps you can um, give us a little bit of insight on how you see uh, this issue of export restrictions being addressed so that countries can continue to have access to, to vital goods during this pandemic. You have the floor, Mr. Yo. Um, I must clarify that I've led government for many years now, and, I, and I'm not in a position to speak on behalf of the Singapore government. The COVID should have been a unifying experience for all of mankind. It is a challenge confronting all of mankind, but the opposite has happened. It has divided us further, and that's very troubling. Uh, there's only so much the WTO can do because there are deep divisions in the world today, which the WTO can ameliorate but cannot fully overcome. Um, I, in full sympathy with uh, Vice Minister Wang's proposals for greater transparency and easing of the trade in PPE, uh, I also follow closely the view by China's CDC that cold chain may be a major source of transmission of COVID. Now, if that were the case, a major improvement in global coal chains must be put in place. Uh, I'm associated with a logistics company which does Trans-Pacific freight. And sea freight from East Asia to America is booming. Uh, American companies are restocking and China is the only major country manufacturing. Uh, these have huge implications for the world. This year, China will grow probably over 2% the rest of the world would have fallen back 5%, 10%. The longer COVID hovers over the planet, the greater the differential. And this will create new tensions in the global trading system. What is frustrating is the WTO is paralyzed because it is members driven. 
And even to begin the discussion, the members must agree to discuss. And because of that, we are shunted to the side, almost irrelevant. There is a case to be made for a stronger secretary and one which can initiate actions. I'm not saying that we should move to the other extreme and give too much power to the secretariat, but the current balance is completely inadequate to the challenges confronting all of us. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Yo. And um, I mean, some of these issues that you raised, um, as you said, are, are issues for members to decide on in terms of, you know, shifting more power to the secretariat, etc. But perhaps I can uh, move to Ambassador Shea. Um, you've heard um, a little bit, a lot of what has been said, especially on this issue of COVID. And um, I'd like to ask you how, um, like Mr. Yo said, there's only so much that WTO can do. Um, the rest really lies with countries. So what is it that the little that WTO can do um, in this case and try in trying to address this issue of the pandemic and getting the economy going again? You have the floor, Ambassador. Well, well, thank you, uh, Bonai. Uh, I, I agree with the Minister Yu. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's perhaps been the country hardest hit by COVID-19. We have over 250,000 uh, fatalities associated with COVID, and I suspect the American people are not looking to the WTO for answers for this problem. I mean, with, for, for, with that said, I mean, the U.S., the Trump administration has allocated $20 billion for vaccines and therapeutics and foreign assistance and our private sector companies have been very active and we have two uh, two companies that in, 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 the, in the news recently that have shown very promising results about the effectiveness of, of potential vaccines. So that's really good news. Uh, but as far as the WTO, yes, we agree that any trade emergency measures that have been taken uh, in the crisis should be temporary and proportionate and transparent. And we have notified what we have done uh, to the WTO and the WTO can play an important role in monitoring uh, these measures. Uh, we have also, I think someone mentioned um, the TFA, the United States has uh, circulated a statement along with Japan, Brazil and Colombia, urging members to accelerate their implementation of the Trade Facilitation Act so that, um, so that we can move vaccines, medicines, PPE more smoothly uh, across across borders. Uh, we also signed on to a statement, uh, I think originating from Canada, uh, warning against export restrictions on, on food, uh, warning about export restrictions in the agricultural sector. So um, there are things we can do. I also agree with the point, I think uh, Vice Minister uh, Wang Xuan made this point, is that the need for new rules around digital trade uh, are, are more necessary than ever. Um, the, the COVID crisis has highlighted the importance of the digital space and, and digital trade. In, uh, so, so having new rules, uh, high ambition standards uh, around digital trade uh, is, is, is critical. And the WTO can play an important role uh, if it actually negotiated an agreement that was a high standard meaningful one. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. And um, I think, yeah, this, it's, a, it's a real challenge, um, COVID, and um, seeing how countries can come together to work to, to finding a solution. In fact, we have uh, the monitoring report that uh, came out uh, just a number of days ago. I think it must might have even been yesterday um, that was put together by the WTO, showing that um, you know the G20 measures that have been put in place, and it's 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 a positive sign to see that some members are actually um, putting in. in place measures that facilitate trade. So this is something that we would like to see um, um, going forward. Um, moving on and perhaps uh, st staying on that issue of, of digital trade uh, that was just raised um, by um, Ambassador Shea. Um, we know that the digital economy um, has been quite central um, uh, during, played a central role during this um, COVID pan pandemic. Um, at the same time, we know that it has raised a lot of concerns uh, regarding sort of the digital divide that exists. And um, the issue of e-commerce uh, is actually being um, addressed in the WTO 
both at a multilateral uh, level because we have a mandate on electronic commerce and then we have a group of countries, uh, like-minded uh, countries who have come together to discuss uh, uh, um, and to come up with um, a, a, an agreement or on, on electronic commerce. Now, of course, um, we know that there's opportunities in this area, but at the same time, we know that there's a lot of vulnerabilities and challenges. So um, on this issue of electronic commerce, and, and perhaps I can um, put this uh, question uh, to Ambassador Shea, um, how do we ensure that we have a balance in whatever outcome um, members agree to uh, in a, a discussion on electronic commerce, especially if it's a, if it's a negotiation. How do we keep small countries um, included, especially when they are, are facing um, challenges when it comes to, to the digital divide? So if I could give you the four, Ambassador, on, on how you see that uh, going forward. Well, um you know, we think digital trade is is good for uh, LDCs and for you know uh, developing developing countries. So, I mean, we are seeking uh, through uh, the WTO a high ambition agreement uh, in this plurilateral context, which means uh, you know ensuring free flow of data uh, across borders, uh, being very careful about uh, data localization requirements. Uh, not requiring uh, companies to uh, turn over their, their source code, not discriminating against uh, digital products. We feel strongly that the moratorium on um, customs duties for digital transmissions uh, should be made permanent. Uh, we, we, we're currently extending it to, uh, to, to MC12. So, um, you know, we, we feel that uh, participating in, in this, these types of rules uh, and further the development of, of uh, LDCs and, and um, uh, developing countries. Uh, at the same time, you, you know, the United States is not against special and differential treatment for countries that truly uh, need uh, that help. Uh, we support special and differential treatment for, for LDCs. And there's certainly a category of uh, developing countries, a subcategory within the developing country category that, you know, are, are definitely uh, uh, potentially worthy uh, of, of uh, special differential treatment. So um, I'll stop there, but I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Ambassador. And um, perhaps I can uh, ask um, our Minister Hakuze Aremie, as an LDC, um, a small country who um, clearly is faced with some uh, challenges uh, when it comes to electronic commerce. We know that there are, um, you know, uh, positive opportunities that it can provide for small businesses, but we know that at the same time, um, it can uh, be a, a, a challenge. So how do you see um, a potential agreement on this area going forward, if that is what you would like to see? Um, what, what, is your, what are your views on this? Uh, thank you, Roy. I think for um, for uh, developing countries and African countries in general, um, there are two main challenges to, to first address before we can even uh, speak about, uh, I think, one, concluding an agreement, but ensuring that we have uh, being the regulatory framework, but also the infrastructure to support that agreement and be able to enforce it. Um, if we look at the digital infrastructure that uh, that we required, um, not only digital infrastructure, but also uh, affordable uh, digital devices to our citizens. Uh, this is something that Rwanda has really focused on um, and, and investing heavily in ICT infrastructure, uh, having a fiber optic coverage that now accounts for 90% of our country. But this requires enormous resources and also being able to empower our citizens so that they can have access to the di digital um, uh, devices, which is still a challenge. That being said, I think Rwanda is one of the pioneer countries that has really already tried to one work on an e-commerce strategy uh, with actually um, uh, the, the, the assistance of, of UNCTAD and, 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 and WTO. And uh, we've um, now adopted a law which is under parliament on the protection of personal data and privacy law. Uh, 
which uh, many countries in Africa do not yet have. And second, uh, you know, looking at a continental digital strategy at the African Union level and be able to assess what countries need in terms of, of, of infrastructure skills and then be able to support our SMEs to uh, to, to embrace really e-commerce. Um, with, with the uh, pandemic, these are some of the lessons learned. It's really the, um, I would say, uh, agility of our young people and startups to, to use e-commerce. Uh, we still have to, to ensure that these uh, e-commerce and startups and e-commerce can scale up quickly. But we have seen that we really have, you know, the necessary, uh, I think, skills and innovation and, and the young entrepreneurs who are ready to embrace it. It's up to us uh, as governments to ensure that, one, they have the regulatory frameworks necessary to, to be able to trade uh, safely, but also uh, provide them with, with all the infrastructure they require, but also the payment uh, systems are needed for this. So there are a lot of challenges, but we are really working on it uh, as, as Rwanda to ensure that we can uh, be part of uh, the e-commerce ecosystem as well. Thank you very much, Minister. And it's, 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 it's good to hear that, you know, even as, as small countries uh, like yourself see the benefits um, of this area, but obviously it's an issue of, of time and being able to address uh, those challenges before making any, any commitments. Um, moving to the next issue that I think a lot of you have raised, and it's the issue of reform. And we know this is not something that is necessarily new to the WTO, but uh, we've seen that over the past year, um, it has been um, gaining momentum. And um, perhaps on this issue of reform, I could uh, go to um, Mr. Yo, because I know you mentioned in your statement how you have been a part of, uh, you have attended, in fact, a lot of ministerial conferences. You've been in the system for a very long time. Um, and you made some uh, reference to it, the d difficulty of coming up um, with reforms, especially in the current institutional um, 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 sort of framework that we're working in in the WTO. So I just wanted to ask you um, how or what elements of the reform agenda uh, do you consider um, are particularly important to ensure um, that the WTO remains relevant? And what sort of institutional changes do you uh, see as necessary going forward? Let me speak as um, a global citizen. The, the big problem today is the U.S. attitude towards the WTO has changed dramatically um, from the time when I was trade minister. Now, I can understand some of the frustrations uh, faced by the U.S. and the domestic uh, reaction against continuing almost uncontrolled globalization which has disadvantaged a lot of people, not only in America, but in many parts of the world. And the big challenge for the U.S. is China. So really the crisis of the WTO is at its core, a problem between the U.S. and China. Now, the process by which reform is addressed in the WTO does not lend itself to negotiation between China and the U.S., of course. This is not only a matter between China and the U.S. This would be very objectionable to the general membership. But China-U.S. negotiation is an essential part of global reform of the WTO. And we need a mechanism to bring this about. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm no longer a diplomat, so I don't have to be polite. I'm just saying uh, the things which I feel strongly about. And really, China must agree that the WTO, which you joined a long time ago, the suit no longer fits. Deng Xiaoping used to say, China should keep a low profile and hide its glint. But when China has grown so many times since 2001, however hard it tries to hide, it cannot hide. It's too big now. And for many countries in the world, China is its biggest trading partner. So I can understand the frustration in the U.S. But at the same time, I listened to Ambassador Shea carefully. 
if the business of the WTO is a, con is a global convergence of systems, then it's not going to work. I mean, China has a different nature from Singapore, from the US, from Rwanda. And the reason why the WTO works is it doesn't interfere the deep operating system of every country so that each country can remain itself. There is almost a principle of subsidiarity in the WTO. It's a principle, it's a moral principle of the European Union, which is why I've always felt that a key catalyst for a new consensus in the world must be Europe. And Europe must not only be defending its own interests. I think Europe has a responsibility to almost sit down with China and the US and say, look, it is going to be a heterogeneous world. This is the process of history. We are not going to converge. This is not the end of history. But at the same time, to live in peace, we must be able to talk, to agree on what's common, and to trade where we can. And I hope Europe can play this role. I think it, because no one else can. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Yeo. We always uh, appreciate uh, concerned citizens' um, views. Um, perhaps uh, at this point, I should give the floor to uh, Vice Minister Wong um, to react on, on what um, has been said by Mr. Yeo. You have the floor, Vice Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Before I take up the, this question, I have to make a few remarks in relation to e-commerce. Uh, as far as China's experiences are concerned, e-commerce has played a very important role in generating job opportunities for women, for young people, for farmers, for people living and working in the uh, poverty-stricken areas, because it could enable those people to set up shops on the internet through e-commerce and sell their products. And in this regard, I think for an e-commerce discussion to be productive, uh, it's also necessary to have some uh, technical and economic cooperation to pave uh, the groundwork in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of uh, payment methodology, as well as the infrastructure like uh, power. Without electricity, without power, there's uh, no e-commerce to speak of. But with regard to the uh, reform agenda, uh, I also want to say I echo what uh, E.G. Wayne mentioned a moment ago. We should have the right sequence of the WTO reform. In our view, the dispute settlement is the top priority for any WTO reform. Uh, without a proper WTO dispute settlement mechanism in place, that might would be right, as mentioned by the Deputy DG, uh, Mr. Wolf. So in order to prevent might becoming right, we need to uh, reinstall the effectiveness of the dispute settlement mechanism. At the moment, we do have a MPR, the uh, multi-party interim appeal, but this is an interim solution. It is not meant whatsoever to replace the uh, applet body. So my view is that the top priority is to install the uh, dispute settlement uh, mechanism. Secondly, we think uh, agriculture subsidy should be addressed as also an important agenda item. It is a shame that for so many years of negotiation, the WTO has not been able to slash the excessive amount of agricultural subsidy. This excessive amount of agricultural subsidy is trade distortive. It is very unfair. It makes the farmers, small scale farmers in developing countries very vulnerable. This huge amount of agricultural subsidy also leads to overcapacity in the global market. So this agricultural subsidy should be addressed as one of the top priorities if any WTO reform is to be successful. 
uh, with regard to uh, the the point that maybe uh, market orientation should be part of the reform agenda, I cannot disagree with that more. Market orientation is like a a beauty context which has not much to do with the WTO parameters. Uh, we do not want to implicate the issue like which economic model is more beautiful than other economic models. If we implicate such topics, then we are going to overwhelm the WTO. And any WTO reform along those lines would uh, lead the reform to no place. Uh, indeed, as cited by uh, former Minister Yu, China has uh, grown significantly in terms of uh, GDP over the years, uh, thanks to uh, the hard work of the people of China, thanks to the uh, correct and rightful leadership of the Communist Party in China, and also partly thanks to the liberalization of uh, tariffs, a trade regime in China and outside China. And we are very glad that China has been the largest uh, trading partners for 120 countries and, and economies. And China has been the uh, largest export destination for all the LDCs for the uh, last decade. Uh, but I would say that the WTO by nature and by mandate is a trade organization. Its priority should be focused on the trade dimension. And we, do, we hope that uh, other elements outside trade should not be uh, involved to uh, prevent the WTO reform uh, from being uh, productive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister. And I'm just looking at our time. I think uh, there's so many things we could have spoken about. And I think, uh, you know, what you've raised shows some of the difficulties that members are having um, in, in the WTO to see how to move forward with, on some of this reform agenda. Um, perhaps just one last question before uh, we move on to questions from the public, and I would like to ask DG Wyant. Um, right now, as you know, uh, negotiations haven't, which is one of the main uh, uh, sort of pillars of the WTO's work, have not been moving for a very long time. And uh, we've been seeing now, as a result, um, sort of uh, like-minded groups getting together and moving forward and trying to advance discussions um, in particular areas. Um, what does this mean for multilateralism, especially when the WTO really is about ensuring that we have a system that includes all countries, big and small? Um, is there a threat there? I mean, we're also seeing um, these proliferation of RTAs, the AFC, CFTA. We're also seeing RCEP recently. So what, what would be your view about this? Can, can the two sort of coexist? Um, what does this mean for WTO and multilateralism, especially for the smaller country who might not be included in all of this? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, qu uh, question, Bonai. Um, but let me perhaps come to the issue that has been discussed uh, uh, just before, and that is the question of the economic systems uh, that the WTO can deal with. And um, I would situate myself uh, somehow in between the positions taken by Ambassador Shea and, and, and uh, Vice Minister Shoban Wang. Um, we all share the same planet. We are all part of the same global economy. We have to find a way to organize our relationships on the basis of rules. Because if it's not a rule of law, it's the law of the jungle and we are falling back on power-based diplomacy uh, with all the distortions that that creates. On the other hand, we also have to see that if we want to keep uh, trade fair and uh, open, it has to be fair. And there are currently level, level playing field uh, distortions that are coming from certain Chinese practices uh, and uh, given the role of the state in the economy. Now, the WTO is not the place to drive systems change. It's not about regime change. This is about dealing with the consequences of certain economic systems 
and to make sure that these are being dealt with in a manner in which everyone can live with. And that requires a compromise on all sides. But I think there is a deal to be made. I think it is fair to say, and the US is not alone in this, we share a lot of the uh, uh, problems we see from the fallout of the Chinese economic system um, in terms of distorting the level playing field. Uh, that is why we've been working on industrial subsidies. So we agree with a lot of these complaints. We need to find rules to deal with that that are not about forcing regime change because that would be, that, that's not the role of the WTO and it's unrealistic. I also think it is not necessary. But at the same time, the message to the US would also be to say, if we want to uh, then enforce these level playing field rules, then obviously we need an organization that can, where we can negotiate these rules and where we can enforce them. Because we have seen that the alternative of bilateral negotiation and unilateral enforcement does not really work. So I really think that there is a bargain to be struck that caters for the interests of everyone and that does not force regime change. Whether that lives up to Mr. Yeo's uh, uh, plea for subsidiarity, I do not know. But I think there is a zone of compromise that we need to explore urgently. Now I come to your question, Bonai. Um, well, first of all, I mean, we are working with like-minded countries because I think you need to have a certain weight or certain ideas uh, and a certain weight behind proposals when you bring them to the multilateral system. So this is basically preparatory work, which the moment we have something which we think is of interest to a wider membership, we will bring to the WTO. But it ha you have to start somewhere. And if 164 members only work individually and then bring the individual uh, proposals, we will never be able to crystallize point points of convergence. The other question is the interaction between the multilateral trading system um, and uh, 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 preferential trade agreements. And that is a very complicated one and one where we have to be very careful because the basis for the global economy is a strong multilateral trading system. But also what you can do amongst 164 countries or even in a plurilateral agreement at the WTO only goes so far. So that's why I think it makes sense to have additional liberalization, but also regulatory cooperation built on top of WTO requirements. But there have to be strict conditions attached to that. And that means, for instance, that uh, in order to uh, uh, avoid uh, excessive distortions, you have to make sure that you cover essentially all trade uh, in, in, uh, in these preferential trade agreements. Um, and they have to be clearly WTO plus. And in a way, the same uh, principles should apply to the articulation between multilateral and plurilateral agreements in the WTO, i.e. you have to remain open. There has to be a basis and anything that is being done plurilaterally must not detract from the rights of the membership of the WTO in its entirety. So you have to have this openness and inclusiveness. But on the other hand, you also have to recognize that if you are constrained uh, to moving forward only with 164 members on board from the start, you will never get anywhere. And if you look at our plurilateral initiatives at the moment, you can see that there is a momentum building and that you have more and more countries uh, joining uh, 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 these uh, these negotiations, and that is a good thing. And then we will have to see whether we have to work with several layers of commitment, where we start with a multilateral basis, we build something plurilateral on top of it, but it remains open to everyone joining once they are ready uh, 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 to take on uh, additional commitments. And of course, this has to be coupled with uh, support and technical assistance uh, uh, to uh, uh, developing countries in accordance with their real needs, not as a blanket exception from rules. I think that is the wrong way to go for the WTO. There's a problem in an organization where we all believe that trade is supporting development, but at the same time, the main instrument to deal with development concerns in the WTO is by giving blanket exceptions. There's something wrong in the system then. I think we need to have a discussion where we really look at what do developing countries need in order to join initiatives and then make sure that we also organize the technical assistance in support of that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, DG Wind, and um, I think we'll go straight to the questions. Uh, we don't have time for many, but um, I have one here. Um, we've been talking about MC12 uh, uh, in your um, statements. A number of you raised the importance of um, having some outcome at MC12, particularly on fisheries. And we have a question here from uh, Remy Pamiante from the VADA Group, um, who says on the importance of fisheries subsidies negotiations, um, could you ask the panelists whether they are all committed to do the utmost to conclude negotiations by 2020 as per the SDGs. Now, uh, we can't all answer this question, so perhaps I'll go to uh, Ambassador Shea on this one. Uh, the, the, the short answer to the question is absolutely. The United States is absolutely committed to having a meaningful uh, fishery subsidies uh, outcome by the end of the year, which is the, the deadline that that has been set for us. Uh, we've introduced five separate proposals on the subject uh, with a lot of other countries as co-sponsors working with uh, Australia, a lot of Latin American countries. Uh, so this is an incredibly important uh, uh, issue for the WTO uh, as an institution. It's obviously important for the sustainability of the oceans, but this is incredibly important uh, for whether to, to show that the WTO is capable of uh, achieving a meaningful multilateral outcome. So, the, so the, the answer is absolutely committed to it. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, to Minister Hakuzi Aremye, I know that there have been some concerns that have been raised um, in the difficulty of me meeting this 2020 target. So what is your view on this? Uh, thank you very much, Wuna. Uh, I think uh, I would come back to to perhaps one uh, where where we think you know, it, despite challenges that we see to the multilateral trading system, um, on on the on the um, hopes and 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 really uh, a focus for, for African countries to ensure that we can. Uh, stick to, to, to the open trading system by really making uh, the continental free trade area agreement uh, a success uh, starting in January 2021. And as I speak, we're concluding negotiations to ensure that we can meet that deadline. As far as the, um, the, the WTO reform and, and the uh, uh, hopes that, that have been voiced to have conclusion at MC12, I believe, uh, really, it's, it's sort of uh, as 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 African countries, we're in the middle of, of uh, uh, you know tensions that we see uh, among among uh, I would say uh, biggest trading uh, powers, but also largest trading uh, partners uh, to, to our continent and, and our country, uh, which we believe um, you know sort of. Uh, puts us aside, but, but we would like really to see, uh, you know, those issues resolved as, as soon as possible, uh, you know, starting uh, with, with uh, consensus that is really needed uh, to have uh, a new WTO DG uh, Director General uh, appointed. I think uh, former Minister Yeo uh, indicated, uh, you know, highlighted that at the, at the beginning of our conversation. Uh, because uh, without that, I think, you know, all the, uh, uh, the delays that we have seen and, and ensuring that the WTO Secretariat is empowered uh, to play its, its role and, 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 and that uh, we are sure that uh, these, these challenges and tensions and especially the much needed reforms uh, can be uh, acted upon. Uh, we would really, I, I think, encourage all member states so that we can have a uh, consensus of the leadership of the WTO uh, as soon as possible and then uh, get on with the reforms that we all uh, are calling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question, and perhaps this one I'll put to uh, Vice Minister Wong. Um, how can the organization help SMEs in developing countries to boost their businesses? And we know that um, China is actually uh, part of this initiative um, on um, um, uh, SMEs. So, so what would your response to that be? You have the floor. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, in China, SME has played a significant role in uh, generating employment opportunities, uh, tax revenue, and uh, GDP. Uh, we think that uh, 
WTO could uh, play a very instrumental role in helping SME to uh, reach markets outside their uh, home country. And uh, China has been very actively participating in the discussions in relation to uh, SME. Uh, we are willing to have uh, cooperation with other WTO members in uh, the capacity building in relation to SME. Uh, we think uh, there's a lot of potential to be tapped to uh, help SME to reach international market, uh, to sell their products and services. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that that question was coming from Nigeria, from Kelechi Imo. Um, and then maybe we can have one last question. Um, there's a question here from the UN Green Economy. What mechanisms do you propose to effectively mainstream sustainable development, including trade and environment at the WTO? And um, I'll ask um, um, Bas uh, DG Wyand if she can uh, weigh in on this question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I think we need to strengthen the role of the Committee on Trade and Environment, and we need to uh, increase the monitoring role and the deliberation function, because there's a lot of activity going on around the globe in order to deal notably with the climate emergency. But there are also other initiatives that we need to look at. And the first thing is to really have this transparency and this deliberation. Um, and I think we need to uh, 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 also launch an initiative, and that is something we are preparing also uh, inside the EU, uh, and we will reach out to other partners, which is on trade and climate. And I think here we need to look at what can we do in terms of uh, opening up trade in goods and services, uh, which help mitigate uh, climate change, and what can we do in order to green aid for trade. And then I think, as I said, uh, linked to the monitoring function, I think we need to have transparency and early discussions about the measures that individual countries are taking in order to make sure that they are as trade friendly and as little restrictive as possible and that we factor in different concerns. That is the short answer to something which would merit a seminar on its own. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director General. And um, with that, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, we've had some very interesting perspectives on um, the challenges. Um, and uh, I wouldn't want to say that they're insurmountable, but it's true that if we want to be able to address these challenges going forward, uh, we need to ensure that members continue to, to, to speak together to try and find a common solution that um, enables uh, the WTO system to remain relevant, um, not only to remain relevant, but that continues to work for all of its members, uh, large and small. Um, I'm wondering whether I can ask each of you for a 30 second final word um, before we close. I'm wondering whether that's a good idea or not. Um, if you can stick to it, it would be great because that means that we, can, um, we won't lose much more time. So is, if you have any final reflection on what we've discussed with today, um, I'd appreciate that. Um, so perhaps we can start with uh, Ambassador Shea. The U.S. Uh, reform agenda in a thumbnail. Notification, uh, greater notification compliance, uh, reform of special and differential treatment, so there's greater differentiation among advanced developing countries. We need new rules uh, on industrial subsidies and state enterprises, and we do need to reaffirm the centrality of market-oriented principles at the foundation of the WTO, and we need dispute settlement reform, and we need a tariff reset. So there you go. How, how, how was that in 30 seconds? Perfect. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> uh, we'll now um, move to uh, Mr. Yo. The new, the new DG has her work cut out for her. She will need all of the support and all of goodwill. Thank you very much. E even better. Um, next, uh, we'll have uh, DG Wayand. I think I have already set out our ideas for a sequencing of reform. What I wanted to close with is rather than a, an appeal to everyone, the WTO is a member-driven organization, but it is also the responsibility of the members to drive the organization. And that also requires empowering the next director general of the organization, because we need her in order to drive forward the, ne uh, forward the necessary reforms. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, DG Wyant. Um, I would go for Vice Minister Wong. You have the floor. Faith, trust, and confidence in the multilateral trading system is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Minister. And um, last and certainly not least, uh, Minister Hakuzi Aremia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Voina. I think for me, would be looking at the future. In 25 years, uh, Africa will have the youngest population and the largest labor force in the world. Uh, and uh, I would end by a question, how can WTO uh, assist and play its role to make sure that Africa represent uh, more than the 2% global trade uh, in the world today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much to our panelists for joining us. Um, unfortunately, we have no more time to continue discussing some of these very challenging issues. And we, in fact, had one question that was relating to how, um, from Mariana Mendez, about how the WTO has helped women to be included in trade. And in fact, our next DG um, is going to be a woman. So I think that's already um, quite a, a step forward. But to all our viewers that have joined us um, from all around the world, thank you very much. Um, and thank you again to our panelists panelists for sharing and being frank um, about uh, some of the issues and challenges that you see uh, going forward. And we look forward to, to the solutions to all of these. Um, stay safe and thank you very much.